So hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. Uh, I am Ned Belvance, and I am here to talk about addressing security in a multi-cloud world. It's a world that a lot of us are starting to live in now, so it's probably important to figure out how we're going to address that. First, I'd like to start with a story. And this is a somewhat real story where the names have been changed to protect the innocent or guilty as they were. But, uh, you know, in my work being a cloud architect and also doing consulting, I did some work with a global manufacturing company. This is a, you know, Fortune 500 billion dollar company that had been around for a long time. They'd been around for almost 100 years. And as you can imagine, 100 years ago, they weren't really concerned about security from a technical perspective. They might have been secure, uh, concerned about security from a physical perspective at their various plants, but they weren't worried about someone getting in on the internet because there was no internet. Now, obviously, their focus on security had to change over time. And as they moved into the more modern era and started to pick up new products and features, they had to plan for how they were going to address security. So that is going to be the story that we focus on as we walk through what multi-cloud security means and the main pillars around how to support a company as it makes this transition from an on-premises or a single cloud to a multi-cloud environment. So like I said, I'm Ned Belvance. Um, my Twitter is Ned1313. My website is nedinthecloud.com. Feel free to reach out. My DMs are open. Uh, if you have any questions later about the presentation, you can absolutely reach out to me or anything else you might be curious about. The current state of security, how is security deployed in most organizations today? It usually comes from your infrastructure ops team and your infosec team assuming that those are two separate teams. And that's sort of how it was deployed at this manufacturing company. In fact, for a long time, they didn't have an InfoSec team, and then they did split off and create one, but it was largely focused on operations and infrastructure security, which meant there were some gaps when it, when it came to applications, but also they just had a mentality. And that mentality was that of no. Whatever you came to them with, and, and ops usually gets a bad name, a uh, bad rep for this. They're often known as the department of no. You know, you come to them with a new application or a new idea and their immediate response is no. And, and there's a good reason for that. Like ops, their job is to keep things up and running. And introducing change introduces the potential for things to go down. So the ops team, would rather say no than yes, because saying yes means more work and potential downtime. And if ops doesn't say no to your project, then there's a pretty good chance that security is gonna say no. So you came to ops and they gave you the thumbs up, you go to security and they're like, no, that's insecure, we can't do that. And again, it makes sense from the incentives of the InfoSec team. They want their business to be as secure as possible. And the most secure business is one where nothing is accessible and you, they restrict the ability of what people can do. So when you come to them and say, hey, I got this new app or I'm really interested in deploying this thing in Microsoft Azure, or you know, have you heard about AWS and Lambda? Their first you know, thought in their head was like, nope, that's publicly accessible, we can't do that. And that was the longstanding attitude of this manufacturing company for a long time. What that attitude ended in was their data centers were immaculate from a security and ops perspective. Everything ran smoothly. Everything was in its place. All the applications ran in perfect harmony. And that was great, except all the people that they said no to went out and kind of did their own thing. So when you took a step outside of that data center, things were a little bit different. And it created a lot of issues that started to surface up and it was one of the things that i was brought in uh, along with some other people to try and remedy there was account sprawl so you had all these different developers and business units who had been told no by ops or told no by uh, infosec they went out and created their own accounts in azure and aws and 
on any number of different SaaS applications. So there was this massive account sprawl in a multi-cloud kind of way. And the developers were living on an island where they didn't have the support of the ops or security team to check and, and verify that they were doing things properly. I mean, development can only do so much. And even if their intentions are good to make things secure, they may not have the skills necessary or the assessment tools to determine that. And because they've been placed on an island by ops and security, <clears throat> it's very hard for them to know whether they're doing things in a highly secure way. It also created this adversarial relationship between the business units and ops and, and infosec. Business units wanted to do things, ops and infosec stood in the way. And so business units went off and did their own thing. And then ops and, and infosec, when they found out, would drop the hammer on them. And then it became this big argument. And fortunately for the profitability of the company, a lot of time the business units won out because they were able to make the case that hey, we're, we're here to make money as a company and you're stopping us from doing that. So if you try to shut this down, that's gonna have a negative financial impact. And so ops and InfoSec had to kind of suck it up and be like, all right, we, I guess we're gonna try to figure it out. And one of their solutions was, well, if we can't secure it, we will just log everything. And they had a SIM and everything was just being dumped into that SIM. Was it important? Who knows? But we have it logged somewhere, so if auditors come calling or you know whoever wants to take a look at our logs, we'll, we'll be able to produce that information. But there wasn't a whole lot of analysis going on there. And lastly, I've encountered this several times in different organizations. There are a lot of policies on paper for how things should be operated and secured, but they were largely just that. They were on paper. They weren't enforced through any standards uh, or, or specialized means. In fact, one of the problems that they really ran into was there wasn't just one standard, there was many different standards, and sometimes those standards were in direct conflict with each other. So think about this whole situation that we have going on here, and now we're introducing this concept of multi-cloud, and multi-cloud is going to add more networks. So now you're dealing with not just your internal network and maybe one cloud network, you're dealing with multiple cloud networks, you're dealing with multiple identities. So you've got your Azure Active Directory identity and your AWS IAM identity. And if you have more than one account, you've got more than one IAM identity. You're dealing with your login to Salesforce and any other number of SaaS things that, that were uh, in use. And then you have your identity for systems that already existed on premises. That's a lot of identities. And the number of deployments that were happening goes up, right? Your ops team typically used to, I don't know, maybe deploying something new every two weeks or every four weeks, whenever that change window rolls around. But that's not the paradigm that the de developers are used to when they're deploying to the cloud. Their frequency of deployment is actually much faster than that. They might be deploying daily or even more often than that. So now you have more deployments to deal with and you need a way to analyze those deployments before they go out the door to production. And you're dealing with multiple new technologies. It's not just infrastructure as a service in all the various different clouds. It's all of the platform as a service and serverless features that exist. How do you deal with Lambda from a security perspective, AWS Lambda? How do you deal with Azure SQL, which is you know, SQL as a service? And then how do you deal with the SaaS-based technologies like Office 365 or Salesforce? What's the security responsibility of you as the company uh, versus the responsibility of the hoster? Sometimes that's hard to tell. And then once you know your responsibilities, how do you actually get your arms around that security? There's a lot of questions here. Fortunately, I feel like I have some of the answers, maybe not all of them, but at least got some of them. There are six security fundamentals that I like to think of when we're dealing with a multi-cloud type environment. And at the very top is identity. Identity is really the key to everything. Identity is how you get access. So identity needs to be the first thought in your head of how am I going to properly secure my environment? The second one is data. What are you using with your identity? You're trying to get access to data within the organization. 
that data needs to be secured in a way that is proper, but still usable by the end users and the clients that need to get access to it. The data and identity reside on infrastructure of some kind. So obviously there is an infrastructure component here. And in most cases, we're fairly competent at that already because the infrastructure is not that different than what we've had in our data centers. But there are still some questions around how you manage infrastructure for those platform as a service features. Automation absolutely has to be a part of the security conversation. Automation allows you to become more secure and still deal with that rapid pace of innovation that's coming from the development side of the house. And <clears throat> speaking of that development side of the house, there has to be collaboration between teams. And I recently listened to a really interesting podcast. I think it was on Arrested DevOps that was talking about team structures and you know the idea of a DevOps team versus a specialty team and collaboration came up. And I'll get into this a little bit more later, but the interesting thing is collaboration happens generally just between two teams. When you add a third team, you go over the number of people that can effectively collaborate together. And then finally, analytics. I mentioned that SIM that's hanging out all by itself. Analytics plays a big part in assessing the level of security that you currently have and looking for active threats within your environment. Let's dig into these a little bit deeper, starting with identity. You know, if, if someone can impersonate root, then honestly, the rest of your security controls, they don't matter a whole lot. If they can get administrative access to your cloud portal, or they can get root to a box that has control over everything else, you're kind of hosed at that point. So identity is where everything starts. And it starts with having a centralized identity source. This is hard to do. It does require discipline, but it's an absolute must for organizations of any size. You need a centralized identity source that is your source of truth for who people are and how they authenticate. In addition to that centralized identity source, you need to have role-based access control. And you'll hear people beating the RBAC drum, and I don't blame them. It is a very con convenient way to do things once properly set up. Again, just like the centralized identity source, it requires a certain measure of discipline on your part to determine the proper roles that should exist, the actions that those roles should be able to do, and then the assignment of those roles. That is an exercise that you need to go through, and it's not necessarily easy, but when you're done, it does make your life a little more, a little simpler and more secure. When you are assessing how to apply that role to a user, they, the assignment of a role should always be group-based and not individual user-based. I take this from, uh, if I think back to the days of managing file shares in Windows, and you would go to try to rationalize the permission structure on one of those file shares. And everybody knew that best practice was to use groups to grant access to file shares. But, oh, Fred from accounting, he just he needs access to this one folder. Let's just give it to him. We don't need to create a group. Well, now Fred has access. And maybe Marlene from purchasing also needed access. And John from IT needed, and next thing you know, you have all these individual permissions being granted throughout your file structure, and it makes it almost impossible to unravel. Well, that's not just for file shares. That's the case for a lot of these cloud type deployments that rely heavily on role-based access control. Ideally, you want to use groups because you can go and say, oh, John's a member of that group. He shouldn't have that access anymore. I'm just going to take John out of that group. And it should be that simple, as opposed to trying to hunt through the 30 places where John was granted access on a one-off kind of basis. The next thing is multi-factor authentication. Uh, and this should be a given. At this point, we know passwords are fundamentally broken. People can't remember complex passwords, so they'll either write them down or they use a password manager. And especially for organizations that have a password policy where you have to rotate your password and it has these really esoteric rules, people are just really bad at passwords but they're pretty good at having their phone with them. So if you can set up multi-factor authentication to use a phone or a token or something similar to that, 
that's going to increase the level of security that you have. And now there's a lot of different ways to do this, whether it's through the phone, Google has their authenticator app, Microsoft has theirs. Now there's, you can get security uh, keys that you can use from a number of different manufacturers. There's a lot of options for this and almost every centralized identity source supports multi-factor auth. The last thing is privileged account management. And I know I'm going through a lot of stuff on identity, but like I said, identity is the linchpin here. If you don't have your identity secured, then all your other security stuff kind of falls by the wayside. And that's nowhere more true than with privileged account management. What I'm talking about are accounts that are highly privileged in what they're able to do. Think about your you know, global administrator in Azure, your domain administrator in Active Directory, whatever the equivalent might be in Salesforce, let's say. There is always going to be a need for accounts that are highly privileged and can do really important things, but you need a way to secure that account so that no one can use it unless they have a justified reason. They're authenticating that privilege through multi-factor authentication, and they are only granted that level of privilege for a narrow window of time that it would take to accomplish their goal. I know Microsoft makes a product around this. I believe Duo Security has something like this too. But the whole idea is restrict down as much who can access a privileged account and what they can do with it and when they can do with it. And obviously it has to be logged as well. So that's identity. Identity is used to access data. And when it comes to data, I say protect the data, not the data store. One of those things is portable. Unless you're in a Die Hard movie and you're part of an elaborate plot to go steal someone's Santa Ray, it's pretty unlikely that someone's walking out with 100 hard drives from your data center. What they could walk out with is 100 hard drives worth of data by exfiltrating it out of your network. So you need to protect the data not the data store. And that means encrypting data when it's at rest, in transit, and sometimes even when it's in memory, if it's sufficiently sensitive or important enough. And what that means is actually running something that the data is not decrypted, even in memory, uh, unless it absolutely has to be. And it can use something called a secure enclave on some of the processors out there. So it's decrypted while it's processed and then re-encrypted before it leaves that secure enclave. That's the level of protection you can apply. And the good news is most of the major clouds encrypt all of their data in transit and at rest by default. If you write something out to Microsoft's object store, it's already encrypted once it gets there. And you can only send it over HTTPS. So it's encrypted in transit. Now, how the data resides on your personal desktop or wherever it's being sent from is another question it should probably be encrypted there as well. The other thing I'll say about data is I have seen these ridiculously complicated classification systems when it comes to data. You know, confidential, highly confidential, super confidential for public, for partner companies, for this, for that. You look at all the labels and classifications and you're like, how is any normal human supposed to understand how I'm gonna classify this data? The data classification and as a result, the determination of how it's treated by your systems needs to be clear and simple. Anything more than like five classifications is asking for trouble and even five might be a bit much. You know, maybe three that are general to everyone and two that are specific to your job function. That's the kind of level of classification that we're talking about here. The other thing is you have to assume that the attackers are already inside the walls. There was this concept of, you know, if we put everything in our data centers behind our firewalls, we're going to be fine. And that is kind of like the M&M model of security. It's got a hard shell, but once you break through that shell, it's ooey gooey on the inside. You need to assume that the attackers can breach through in some way. They can get a toehold somewhere. So how can you minimize the impact of any particular portion of your data center or your cloud being breached? so that they can't land and expand and start exfiltrating your data. Speaking of infrastructure, next infrastructure is, what I say about that is defense in depth, but within reason. So 
the advice that you'll commonly hear is layer your security. And I absolutely agree with that. You do need layers of security where you're trying to filter out the bad actors at every layer and get more precise the closer it gets to the application or the data. AWS has a really great model for this where you have a web application firewall that sits out front. It's more of a DDoS uh, blocker, basically. And then you have your first firewall that's just doing basic filtering based on IP. And then it gets through to the next layer. And maybe now it hits an IDS and IPS where it's filtering out potential attacks. And then it goes through another web application firewall to do a final round of filtering. That's certainly possible, and especially if you're deploying the cloud, you have the flexibility to do that. But just keep your defense in depth within reason. If you make it too ridiculously complicated, first of all, when something breaks, it's going to be super hard to figure out what broke and why. And then all the security in the world isn't going to help you if you can't conduct business, because that's the real impact, right? If you can't process transactions because you made your security layer too complex, the business doesn't care that you're super secure. They care that their customers can't buy tickets to the next show or something like that. That's what they care about, that they can't order that new pair of shoes you just released. If they can't do that, all the security in the world doesn't matter. So be reasonable about it. And in the same regard, make it manageable. You should also create templates for your security. So if someone wants to deploy an infrastructure, create templates that already have the best practices baked into it. This is something that's really easy to do in the cloud because every major cloud has some sort of templating feature, whether it's cloud formation templates in AWS, you can use ARM templates in Azure or their newer blueprints feature, or you could even just use a cross cloud uh, application like Terraform to have these cookie cutter deployments that already have all the security that you want baked into the template. So when your app person's like, I got a three tier app and I'd like to deploy it on Azure, you're like, great, here's the template, just load your app here, here and here, we're good to go. I know that you're at least at this base level of security that I would expect. The final part is listen to users. If they're telling you it's too complex, if they're telling you that it's not functional, if they're telling you that they can't accomplish what they need to do, then you need to find a way to restructure your defense so that your users can get their work done. Because if they can't get their work done through your system, they're going to go around your system. And that's where a lot of the security breaches end up happening is when someone does a, does a runaround around to all of your awesome security stuff, they set up an EC2 instance with a public IP address that's sitting behind all of your security because they're tired of having to go through all these security controls to make a configuration change. And now that's a point of failure or a, a point that could be breached by an attacker. So listen to users and understand what their pain points are. The next piece is automation. And automation is something that it's absolutely necessary for multi-cloud deployments, but it's also something to be uh, approached with caution, I would say, because humans are fallible by ourselves, but automation can do that at scale. You can go misconfigure one server and maybe bring down a small portion of an application. If you push out a configuration to a thousand servers, you can bring down the entire company. So automation obviously has to be approached with some caution. Now, the things that you should be automating for from a security standpoint is automating for policy and compliance. If you know ahead of time what your security policies are and what regulations you have to comply with, you can bake that into your automation. And that can take a couple different, uh, that can be surfaced up in a number of different ways. One is just baking security into your pipeline deployments. What do I mean by that? Pipeline deployments can be the deployment of infrastructure using infrastructure as code, or could be the deployment of applications. And in either case, there needs to be security checks within that pipeline to ensure that things are done in a consistent and secure manner. So if you're deploying your infrastructure templates that I talked about in the previous slide, those 
ideally should be done through a pipeline where there's some checks in that pipeline to make sure that you're following security best practices. Let's say for instance, any firewall rules should never be allow RDP and SSH from anywhere. That's just not a rule you should probably ever have. So you might want to have just a stage in the pipeline that checks the firewall rules in the new deployment for anything that allows remote access from everywhere. That's, that's probably not a good plan. Same thing from an application deployment standpoint. When an application is first being compiled, there's a number of different security software packages out there that can check the security of the application for common exploits and known vulnerabilities and best code practices. And then once the code is compiled, you can put it through another suite, especially if it's being put in a format like a container. There's container security testing tools that can probe and also just verify that the base image that the container is based off of is using secure components as well. So having that baked into the pipeline gives you a fuzzier feeling because if your developers are doing, say, a deployment a day to production, you as a an individual contributor and your team as InfoSec or Ops is not going to have the bandwidth to constantly be doing security checks. So you either have to slow down the deployments, which is not going to make the business and developers very happy, or just hope that they're doing their best. Uh, and security is more of a trust but verify kind of situation. The next thing that I would say is place sanity checks in your deployment and manual gates. So automation is great, but before that goes out to production, you might want a manual gate there to just make sure you actually want to deploy the thing that's trying to be pushed. People have been known to fat finger things from time to time, and this might not be a security thing, but it's certainly uh, something to just remind people of. S3 on the East Coast went down for, what is it, like 20, maybe not 24 hours, like 12 hours a couple of years ago. Not because someone did something malicious, but because someone was taking a portion of S3 down for routine, routine maintenance. Instead of putting in something like 10, they accidentally put in 100 and took down 100 nodes instead of 10, which created a cascading series of failures. Hopefully, they've put a manual gate in there that sort of spot checks and goes, wait, wait, do you really want to shut down 100 nodes? That sort of thing needs to be in your automation, uh, also from a security perspective. Collaboration is another one, and collaboration is all about figuring things out early in the process so that later in the process, it doesn't come back to bite you. Part of that is shifting InfoSec left in your process. So if you imagine your deployment or your design or architecting process as going from left to right, a series of stages, a lot of people don't consult InfoSec until they're almost at the end. And InfoSec steps in and does an audit, and then they find all this stuff. And a lot of the time, at that point, the infrastructure is already deployed or the design has been you know, heavily vetted. And now security is asking for changes that require a full redesign. And sometimes they get shot down if it's gonna to be too much, too disruptive, uh, or you have to go back to the drawing board, which slows things down. If you can bring them in early in the process and have them be part of that initial design, they can point out those things much earlier when it's still just something on paper before you actually start building out a full solution. There's this idea, <laughs> that's been called DevSecOps, which is a team that is a combination of development, security, and ops. And I'm not so sure about that as a, a, an actual baked concept, but I will say that getting all of those teams in the same room would be immensely helpful. So you're probably gonna have a DevOps team that has some developers and a couple ops people, and they're responsible for a specific application or service. Security might not be part of that. Security is often their own team, but there should be some level of collaboration early on in the process where you have to get all these people in the same room. And I'm gonna say whenever possible, get them in the same physical room. There's a certain level of trust that gets built when people are in the same space with each other that is difficult to build in a remote context. Not that you can't, and if you can't bring them all in the same room, it's not economically feasible, then don't, but Ideally, get them all in the same room and talking 
And then you tend to discover things early in the process that will help you build a more secure environment and build that environment faster. The other thing is to understand your goals and priorities from the beginning. What's the number one goal, number one priority, number two, and number three? And what is the end goal of whatever project you're currently working on? If security is trying to say that you have to do something that will violate the priorities or cause them to shift, then you have stance to push back and say, this is the priority, this is the end goal for this project. If you want to change that, you're gonna have to talk to the project sponsor, which is usually someone a little bit higher up. And then in the same regard, it gives security an understanding of, oh, okay, this is the priority. This is why we're doing this. And so it helps them get on board with a project that otherwise they might just wanna stop out of their habit of saying no. Finally, analytics. I like to say when it comes to security log events, it's like finding a needle in a needle stack. That's not so easy. How do you know what's a false positive and what's important? Really, the best way to do this is analytics. Clouds are really chatty. It's just so ridiculously chatty. They create so many logs. It's unbelievable. You have the logs from the management console. You have the logs from each service. And then you have the logs from your own application. And that leads to log exhaustion. The ops people that are trying to parse through these logs, the security folks that are trying to figure out what's important, what isn't, there's just not enough human power to get through it all one by one. You can't just look at individual log events. You need a way to prioritize. And for that reason, you need to bring analytics into the mix. And I'd highly recommend standardizing on a single platform for the ingestion of logs and their analysis. Again, that's going to require some discipline because every cloud has their own platform and then there's third-party utilities. If you're in a multi-cloud type environment, third-party utilities probably going to be the best way to go. Otherwise, you're going to have to figure out how to use something like CloudWatch and CloudTrail in AWS. You're going to figure out how to use Azure Monitor in Azure. And you know maybe you're running Splunk on-prem and something else in Google Cloud, it's gonna be really difficult to work with all these different platforms. It's better if you can get everything into one platform. And also what I was saying about, you don't have enough human power in your organization to look through all these security logs. The other thing is that's probably not your core competency. There are companies that have built their reputation on being really good at analyzing logs and finding potential threats and you know active, things that are happening within your environment. Farm it out to those companies. Yeah, it's gonna cost a little bit. Yes, you could maybe do it yourself, but is that really what you wanna spend your money on? Probably makes more sense to spend your money on automating and ensuring the security of your environment and letting some other third party do the actual analysis of logs and raise up issues to you when they find them. So to kind of just bring it all back around, Let's take it back to this global manufacturing company and where they were at as they were approaching this cloud change, this multi-cloud world. They realized they had to modernize their operations. <clears throat> the data centers that they had sort of grew organically around the manufacturing facilities. You know, they got this new fangled piece of hardware back in like the 80s or 90s and it had a server that was associated with it. So, oh, okay, we need to build a room for this. All right, we'll put that in there. Oh, and you know, now we have Lotus Notes. So, okay, well, we need to put a server in our server room for Lotus Notes. And <clears throat> now we need to make that server room a little bit bigger. And so it was very organic growth with not no clear design. It's not the way you would design a data center or an IT infrastructure today. So they were coping with the need to transform the way they were doing things to a newer way. They also had a certain level of autonomy between all the different manufacturing plants. And that autonomy had led to multiple standards when it came to IT. This is the way the East Coast does it. This is the way the West Coast and the Midwest does it. So it, it required getting down to a single standard as well. So what did their global outlook look like? What were they trying to accomplish here? What they were trying to do was adopt AWS and Azure. In fact, some of their 
business units had already gone and spun up things in AWS. So they had to deal with that. And then there were other things that made more sense to deploy in Azure, specifically because of the way the application ran. I think it was like a, um, what a SAP, I think it was that they wanted to run in SAPs like, certified to run on Azure. And so they're like, okay, we'll, we'll run that in Azure as, as well as some other applications. Plus they wanted to start using Office 365 and Teams for collaboration. Not surprisingly, some of their business units had decided to use Slack because Slack was free to start and it was easy to sign up. But some of the enterprise controls that the company wanted just didn't exist in Slack. Plus they were already gonna go to Office 365 and Teams was free. So that was another, you know, Thing that they wanted to adopt. They had multiple data centers in multiple countries and they needed to go through a rationalization process of how many data centers do we actually need and not just the ones that organically popped up around our plants. And they were looking at <clears throat> a major network and data center refresh based off this rationalization. What does our new network look like? How are we going to restructure our WAN to take advantage of cloud? Because that does change the flow of traffic in your network. And finally, they were doing work with the DOD. And so they needed to achieve FedRAMP certification, which is all about process and policy and how it applies to your operations. So that's sort of the global outlook of what they were dealing with. And so I and a team of ind other individuals helped them map out a road to success and start putting some things together. So, I mean, just at a high level, what, what did we do? What was the process by which we did this? The first thing was having a clear idea of their business initiatives and goals. That whole goals and priorities thing that I talked about, bef about before, that was the beginning. We said, what are your initiatives? What are your goals? Where do you want to be in a few years? Because those initiatives and goals are going to inform the way that we approach your multi-cloud architecture and also your security posture. Then we did a full review of their existing policies. All those paper policies that were maybe being followed, maybe not. Well, part of the reason they weren't being followed is because they obstructed people from getting their job done. And if they, if I have to choose between following this paper policy that no one's enforcing and getting my job done and making my boss happy, I'm gonna get the job done, right? So we had to do a policy review and assessment of those policies, figure out which ones were being followed and which ones were being ignored, and then figure out should that policy be altered to accommodate the way that things work today, or do we actually have to in start enforcing this policy? And is there a way to do that through IT controls as well as you know, just talking to people and saying, hey, we're gonna start enforcing this. You know, you're gonna have to find a way to work within the confines of this policy. Once we had that policy in place, a policy review done, we had a good framework for how to approach security. And the first portion of that was making sure that identity was unified across the organization. And <clears throat> the IT department and security department had actually already done a good job of this internally. They had you know, Active Directory, they had some other LDAP type applications, and they had invested in a centralized identity management system where their human resources app was the source of truth for identities, and that fed into the system, which then created accounts in the other systems within their organization. But this was all on-premises stuff and these business units and developers that have kind of gone around them to do other things, what if they had created you know, multiple AWS accounts with identities all over them that weren't linked to the centralized thing. Uh, Office 365 required Azure Active Directory. How is that going to interface with this system? And then there was things like Salesforce and Workday and a couple other SaaS apps that they were looking at. How are they going to federate all of those different identities? and use multi-factor. Fortunately, the system they already had in place could absorb those. We just had to figure out where those things existed and then get them integrated with this centralized identity application. The other big thing was conditional access to resources. And this was all about figuring out whether when someone asks for access to a resource, if it should be granted depending on their current conditions. So if they're on a work laptop in a work location, then probably grant them access and don't have an additional challenge. 
if someone who normally works out of New York is suddenly trying to log in from Beijing, that seems a little strange. Maybe we should either challenge that with additional authentication or just shut down access and report it as an event. So some of the decisions about access to resources, especially data, was based off of this conditional access. And that was something that we could pretty easily roll out using some of the Microsoft technologies as well as their centralized identity management. Their applications and infrastructure were all being built with scripts and manual steps, especially even in the cloud. So they weren't using any kind of AWS scripting or cloud formation to deploy out their infrastructure. Everything was kind of just done manually, as well as the builds of their virtual machines and the application deployments on them. It was still someone like RDPing into or SSH into a box and running a set, series of scripts to install an application. The problem with that is because they wanted to be part of FedRAMP and they wanted to adhere to these regulations, each new environment had to be fully vetted. And if you weren't following an automated process, then that required the person doing the vetting to log into each of those systems and run checks to make sure you did it right. That's really hard. What we ended up doing was helping them create these code deployment pipelines for infrastructure and applications where the whole process was validated to know that, well, if you put in these inputs, you would get the same output every time, just like a manufacturing line, which fortunately made a lot of sense to them. And now the people who were validating it didn't have to validate all the individual components coming out. Sure, they still did QA, just like you would in a manufacturing line, but for the most part, they just validated the pipeline and said, yep, this meets our requirements, you are good to go. And if you need to make a change to that pipeline, maybe that's what we need to audit as opposed to these individual components really sped up their deployment process those pipelines were also able and this is an ongoing process to validate security for applications so applications that were being deployed there was a stage in those pipelines that would check for common security vulnerabilities uh, as well as make some other security checks depending on what the application was um and then finally for the moment, at least, they were using native cloud tools to do compliance and policy checks in the clouds that they were currently in. And so for like Azure, they were using Azure Security Center to do ch policy checks for how things were configured there. And for AWS, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the <laughs> software that AWS has natively. They actually have a couple different ones, but they, they were using that in AWS. They were using the native cloud tools for now. The ongoing recommendation is it's better to shift to a third party tool than to try to use the native cloud tools in each cloud you're using. Because they were multi cloud, that means that their ops people had to understand how to use each of these native cloud tools. Now, I say that's a future plan, and that's because even though this project, portions of this project were completed, the road to being more secure in a multi-cloud world, it's it's not a destination. It's like the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. You're you're never gonna get there, but you can see it. And you wanna stay on the path that's leading you there. But security is a path, it's not a destination. There's always changes you can make, improvements that you can make to make your organization more secure, especially in a multi-cloud world. And if I would you know, leave you with any piece of advice when you're analyzing your environment, it's to start with goals and policies, figure out what you're trying to achieve, have that inform your security posture. And then from a practical standpoint, investigate third party tools that can work across multiple clouds instead of heavily investing in any particular native cloud tool, because you may migrate off of one of those clouds at some point and onto a new one, and you don't want all the energy and time you spent into learning that native cloud tool to be for nothing. You want to have this third-party tool be able to just adopt this new cloud and apply the same principles and practices. So that is all the time. Well, I won't say this all the time, but that is the end of my presentation. I'd now like to open up 
for Q&A. And I think there's already some questions in the can. Uh, let's see, question. Um, code deployment pipelines would help greatly with enterprise productivity, not just security. Well, not exactly a question, but I absolutely agree with that. <laughs> it's certainly true. Uh, how do I open this? Oh, I see. Hold on. I've never gotten to use the questions before in this particular webinar software. Uh, let's see. So I have uh, a question here that's asking about why they chose to use the native cloud uh, to use Azure Security Center for Azure instead of using another tool. And you know, it was really, honestly, it was completely out of convenience. Um, Azure Security Center was there, it was functional. All they had to do was check a box and it was up and running. And like I said, that's a good short-term approach, but in the longer term, I think the move is gonna be to engage more with the third party tool and they were already vetting a few when i rolled off that particular project so i'd imagine at this point they're probably onboarding one of those right now um let's see what else do we have in terms of deployment pipelines do you have a particular recommendation for a pipeline i i i don't like to make product recommendations, because <laughs> uh, that can come back and bite me. Um, and I'm not being paid by anyone to make a recommendation. But uh, I guess if the pipelines that I'm most familiar with is Jenkins and uh, Azure DevOps, which used to be um, Visual Studio uh, Online, both of those seem to work really well. Um, and either of those can function against multiple clouds. They're like Azure DevOps is not just for Azure. It can deploy stuff to AWS just as well. That's not quite tightly as, as tightly integrated, but it can do it. Um, but I would say what's probably more important is that you standardize on a pipeline across your groups as much as possible. Because if you're responsible for maintaining eight different pipeline technologies and someone runs into a problem, it's going to be difficult for others to be able to uh, adopt that. Um, see if there's any. Other questions? Uh, yeah, if anybody else has a question, just put it into the uh, questions area and uh, I'm happy to answer it. Ned, maybe while, while we give uh, everyone one last chance to, to submit any remaining, remaining questions, um, I just wanted to plug that I, I mentioned in Ned's uh, intro that he has a couple of podcasts and he was actually uh, a few weeks ago, he was on Pluralsight's official podcast, which if, <laughs> if you haven't heard it, it's all hands on tech. Um, and I, I think that conversation was really great too. So look up, you know, look up Ned's, uh, Ned's Twitter and you can learn about, I, I know that, you know, you do a ton of things. I don't, I'm not, I don't mean to take your plug from you, but I just wanted yeah. to call out that, that specific podcast episode, I think was a really entertaining conversation that you had. So. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And you know what? I honestly, I didn't get the joke with all hands on tech till I said it out loud and I was like, Oh, I get it. <laughs> all hands on deck. <laughs> I there seriously did not catch it until I said it out loud, but uh, yeah, no, it's, it's a good, Good podcast. I've been enjoying listening to it as well for the uh, the other guests. Um, my podcast is Day Two Cloud, and you can find that at Day Two Cloud .io, and it's all about these type of situations when it comes to operating the cloud in on day two, as opposed to just the perfect design that you deploy on day one. Uh, so that that is also a, an avenue for additional information if you're looking for it. And I am really hoping to do a security focused episode in the next month or so. Um, I'm trying to get this one person to book time. <laughs> I just need them to do it. Um, we just had one other question come through that you can jump on if you'd like yeah, to. Yeah, sure. Uh, when you talked about centralized identity, were you referring to centralizing on Azure AD with AD Connect and using SaaS and AWS as registered apps in the Azure AD portal? Uh, in this particular case, I wasn't, though that is certainly an option. Uh, there's a number of different identity brokers out there. Um, they're also called identity as a service. 
So you could certainly position Azure AD as one of those, and it is pretty convenient if you're already an Azure, if you're already using Active Directory, hey, that's super easy. I just, all I have to do is synchronize it to Azure AD and then connect it up with all these other single sign-ons that have been associated with it. So that's a nice solution. I've seen a number of people go with Okta as a centralized broker. Um, and that also does the job. And I know there's a bunch of other identity as a service brokers out there. So I guess it's more along the lines of whatever makes sense for your organization um, rather than you know plugging a, a specific technology. Uh, looks like there's another one. Um, in the long term, do you think that most organizations will be multi-cloud? I think most organizations already are, whether or not they choose to admit it. Um, it depends on your definition of multi-cloud. Most people are thinking, oh, okay, I have deployments in AWS and Azure or GCP or Alibaba Cloud. So I have two or more infrastructure as a service deployments in clouds. But I think you also have to count in a lot of the SaaS stuff that you're using because that does have identity. It has data that's important to your organization. And you're probably already using a number of them. I mean, I, as a small business, rely almost entirely on SaaS to, to do everything. So, you know, whether it's using Trello to organize Asana for task management, um, Workday is one that I've seen a lot. Uh, I think I mentioned Salesforce like 10 times, HubSpot's another one. There's, there's all these SaaS things that have your important data. So figuring out how you authenticate to those and work with the data, um, you don't have as much control, but I, I would call that multi-cloud to a certain degree. Do I think that in the long term, most organizations will be multi-cloud in the more strict sense of infrastructure running in multiple clouds? Um, I would say any organization that's over a certain size will. Some small organizations won't have enough different applications to require that, um, but large organizations have different application profiles and requirements where one cloud might be more useful than another. Um, Last question is, can you share your first slide with your info? Uh, yeah, it's prob there's probably a way to jump to the front, but I don't know what it is. That's <laughs> okay, we get to relive each slide and each bullet point. Live it in reverse. Uh, so yeah, yeah, here's me. Um, Ned1313 is my Twitter handle. Like I said, my DMs are open, um, so you can just message me there. Uh, my website is nedinthecloud.com. Um, and I have courses on Pluralsight. If you are interested in things like Terraform, uh, HashiCorp Vault, or a number of different Azure things, I have courses and all that. And I have an advanced networking for AWS course coming out uh, in probably like two weeks. So uh, a lot of cloudy stuff, because that's obviously my focus. Awesome. Um as we kind of wrap up, Ned, I just wanted to give you the chance to maybe leave one final takeaway with the audience. Oh, geez. Um, I would just go back to two, two final takeaways. One is that it's all about identity. So really take an interest in how people are authenticating, uh, getting authorization and access to your environments. That would be one. And then the other main takeaway is understand what the priorities are for the company you're doing work for and make sure that informs your design from an ops and security perspective. Because if you don't meet those needs, people are just gonna go around the carefully crafted security that you've put in place.